So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, one of the things I find is most interesting about platform business models is the transition of traditional businesses, uh, particularly agriculture or food or things like that. I've often liked to pose the question, if you're going to build a platform around salt and pepper, how would you do that? Well, our next speaker can, has actually done it, and he can tell you exactly how they did it. Um, he was actually the CIO at McCormick Spice, and they've now built a whole new spin-off of figuring out exactly how to do uh, this kind of platform development using uh, old line industries and old line technologies. Fantastically set of interesting ideas. Uh, so let me introduce Jerry Wolf, um, the CEO of Avanda Corporation. Jerry, please come up and join us. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing? You ready to talk about food? Right? You thought this was a platform fun summit. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about food. Um, Malcolm's comments are a great setup for what I'm going to talk to you about. Think about all the examples he gave, talked about music, what you can correlate with music, the code halo around you. Answer this question for me. What do, you, what do you make decisions on more frequently in your life than what you're going to have to eat? Think about it. How many times every day do you make that decision? What's the next biggest thing that happens as a result of that decision? You go to the grocery store. Or you go out to eat. You know, in the U.S., I'm gonna, we're going to start with the U.S. We'll talk a little bit about it globally. But in the U.S., food is a $1.7 trillion business ecosystem. $1.7 trillion. What's the U.S. economy? About 16. So it's about 10% of the U.S. economy. You know what's crazy about it? What's crazy about it is that Billions and billions and billions of dollars are spent to try to convince you to make choices. And here's the crazy part. You're still bored with what you have to eat. Do you realize most households in this country have a, a repertoire of nine meals? Now, some have like 50, right? But, but some have like three. Did, did, you re did you know that, that, that every day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, about 80% of households do not know what they're going to have to eat for dinner that evening? 80. There's 120 million plus households in the US. And half of the 80% still need to go to the store or to stop at like KFC to pick something up. And the giant bubble on the chart, the manufacturers who create the food that ultimately, or the, the components that ultimately we eat, they spend about $52 billion a year just in the US to convince you on stuff to buy. And they get a return of, a, a phenomenal return of investment, and they lose 30 cents on every dollar. So people are bored with what they eat. There's clearly opportunities to expand consumption. There's tens of billions being lit on fire. I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like disruption might be coming this way. We execute 14 billion plus shopping trips in the US each year. Did you know on social networks, two of the three most popular threads of conversation are music. Think about what Malcolm said, are music, and the second, and food, and not necessarily in that order. Talk about the power of Code Halo. What do we know about you if we understand not only what you eat, how you procure the components that you need to do it. 
Who's familiar with Under Armour? You like their gear? What did they just spend nearly a billion dollars on in the last year? What's that? Connected wearables. Actually, they, they spent it on, on connected fitness. Who uses my fitness pal? Yeah, there's like 60 million people who use that. What do you do with it? You record the stuff you eat. Under Armour became a food company. Think about it. Under Armour became a food company. They are a healthy lifestyle business. It's predicated around food. They send you an email every day. I get seven emails from Under Armour last week. Six of them were recommending recipes to me. I wear their stuff, but I mean, I really? Why am I going to eat the veal parmesan that they sent me? Just because Kevin Plank likes it? They've become a food company. They're becoming a platform business. I'm going to tell you about now, I'm going to tell you about the emergence of a platform opportunity as it relates to this thing I'm going to characterize to you as the network of food. It's not the food network. OK? That is a thing. You know what it is. But it's not that. It's the network of food. Here's what's going on. In this sleepy little space of low-cost consumables that you buy at a high frequency, connected behaviors are having an enormous impact. Part of it's from shifting demographics. Part of it's from behaviors from higher consideration items making their way into low consideration items, like doing research online. It creates an opportunity to meet needs in a, of, of consumers in a fundamentally different way. Because the traditional way, which has been in effect since the end of the Second World War until about five years ago, was to do two things. As a CPG manufacturer, consumer packaged goods manufacturer, it was to take about 25% of your revenue and to spend it trying to convince you to buy stuff. Here's how it worked. 10% of the 25%, I got, yeah, about 10, 9, was spent screaming out, buy my brand, it's great. Making you an emotional promise with the brand. Right? Why, do you, why will you like Coke? Why is Coke better than Pepsi? Drink more Coke. Eat more pepper. McCormick's pepper is the best. I'm talking about McCormick. I was a CIO there for 15 years and also had uh, responsibility for a number of areas of strategy, development and implementation. So I'll give you some McCormick examples. So you have about that 9% of revenue being spent on, we call it engagement, awareness. The other two-thirds of that 25% was spent and by the way, most of that money was spent on TV and print advertising. right? Just trying to get you to remember. Because when they wanted you to remember was then when you were walking up and down the aisles of the grocery store, because that's what everybody did. And so the second component of this beautiful two-pronged strategy was then spend two-thirds of the 25% on a hot price at shelf to get your attention, close the deal. That worked phenomenally up until about five, six years ago. In fact, it started to really turn when we had the, re the recession. Because it was a combination of a couple trends coming together. Here's what happened. Up from the end of the Second World War up until that time, 20% of the decisions were made before the, you went to the store. The other 80 were made in store. You know what it's been since, about, since the recession? A complete inverse of that. Now 80% of the decisions are made before you go to the store. You got a list. Guess what? People aren't walking up and down the aisles anymore. You want to know why you're losing 30 cents in the dollar in trade spend? Because nobody sees the deal. But you got consumers who are connected. That first stat, 50% of CPG purchases are being influenced digitally today. That's the lowest number you will find in any of the research. 
five zero. See, because here's the, the funny part about where folks get hung up on, on uh, digital impact and CPG. They go, ah, oh, e-commerce is less than 2%. Yeah, it is. But 50% of the spend is being digitally influenced. It's massive. And by the way, that e-commerce, while it's a tiny number, it represents nearly all of the growth that the entire ecosystem is experiencing. If I had a nickel for every conversation, a nickel, a dollar, for every conversation that I've had with somebody saying, ah, e-commerce, who cares, it's tiny. Connected, ha, I'm going to run another commercial. And then in the next breath, they can't figure out why they're having trouble engaging millennials. Or they can't figure out why they're having trouble engaging consumer, you, consumers who are concerned about a healthy lifestyle. And if you haven't noticed, there's billions that have flown into the food tech space just in the last couple years alone. So here's a quote from the president of uh, Food Manufacturers Institute. That's the big retail trade group in the US, Leslie Saracen. Leslie made it pretty clear. Here's, what's, here's where the future retail's going. Personal, digital, and virtual. Right? And the virtual piece is, quite honestly, people don't really like going grocery shopping. So then why not come up with a hybrid model? Right? For the stuff you don't need to see and touch, why can't that just be ready to go? So here's the idea. When you're making choice around food, more than two-thirds of the time, right, the primary driver is taste. Taste. That's how people choose. If you're interested, number two is value. Number three is uh, wellness properties, nutrition. But taste is the primary driver of food choice. This little company we started, Vivanda, which is a, a, a food personalization technology platform, it's a services platform, it got incubated inside McCormick. McCormick's a $4 billion global spice seasoning flavoring business. And we created this thing that does three things. We took all this knowledge we had, which is, I'll tell you a little bit about in a little bit. The shorthand on is we did three things. One is we created a standardized way to describe taste and texture of any kind of food item and to do it digitally. The second thing is we came up with the concept of a, a service platform to deliver personalized and contextualized recommendations done via API. You're going to see a lot of points in my discussion which really bring together virtually everything you've heard throughout the day. And then the third piece is, is providing data and insights to help inform decisions, business decisions. And you see all the logos in the network diagram, right? Businesses win by connecting efficient and effective activation of food purchases. Right? Repurpose a little bit of those billions that are being lit on fire. Make, make that connection with the consumer, the user, more useful. And the result? These are the people that are in the network of food. These are the folks that need to generate profitable growth because their growth has been tepid over the last few years. And if they don't start doing something about it, they're going to go away. You don't believe that, read what just happened to Heinz and Kraft. There's a pile of unmet need. There's an opportunity to get after it. And the key is finding a way to make a connection with the consumers. So a couple attributes of what we built. So we took this really fun problem, 16,000 aroma chemicals. We can map that into 33 flavors and 17 textures, a bunch of dietary nutrition attributes. We created a, un a unique flavor print for any kind of food item. Took some of the same understanding and text stack. We created the ability to make a fingerprint for each of us. 
Third piece is, how do you match make the two? Right? The hard part isn't the matchmaking. The hard part is describing what something tastes like digitally. There is no such thing yet as a smell meter Maybe. Maybe coming someday. Now, instead of creating a new place for people to go to figure out what they should eat, and I think here's maybe where the innovation is, is what if the you consumer can put it in your pocket. Get some help everywhere you go. So in other words, understand how you make the choices you make around food and now take that with you, which is probably different when you go to ShopRite or Amazon Fresh or you're looking at recipes on Epicurious or All Recipes. Or when you're browsing uh, coupons that are available, or looking at the weekly circular from a grocery store. How cool would it be if you could see things that are right for you, instead of a list of things with a bunch of filters you can apply? And the result of all this, this idea of this platform, which plugs in, is efficient activation. So I, I know there's some folks here from Amazon. These are made up. We're a new company. We're only six months old. We, we, our services primarily go through channel partners, which are retailers and content publishers. And who pays for all this is the manufacturers. So I made some examples up with Amazon because I thought that would help make it easier for you to understand where we're headed. Okay, So we're not doing this with Amazon. We'd like to, but we're not doing it with Amazon. So imagine. Standard Amazon recommendations for products across the top, the first row, second row. See the compatibility score? Here's what we found, and I'll, show, well, I'll come back to that. Compatibility score. It's right for you. Here's a 91% match for you. Which recommendation are you more likely to act on? Here's another example. Amazon Fresh, they're delivering from local food establishments in the market that they're in. Again, let's make some recommendations that have compatibility scores on them. And it's not compatible because a bunch of other people bought similar things to you and now this might be right for you. It's because it's right for you. What we buy and then we look at it comparatively tells us almost nothing about from a food standpoint of why we prefer it. you got to know something else. Here's another example. How about recipe recommendations? Here's matches on recipes. Why does that matter to a retailer? Because if a retailer gets you to click on a recipe and in a digital experience and you're, building a and you're building your shopping cart, if they can get you to click on a recipe, more than two-thirds of the time, you're going to add every single thing on that recipe ingredient deck to your basket. It grows the business. we got some phenomenal data that talks about that. What if, when you were looking at reviews, what if you could understand what the compatibility of the taste profile is of that reviewer to you? Would that review become more valuable to you? If you ever go on all recipes and look up, and do it now, look at lasagna. You get like 4,000 choices. There's like 150 of them that have four plus stars. Which one do you pick? If I gave something a five star lasagna recipe, are you going to pick it? You don't know me. You don't know any of the reviewers either. But if you could compare our taste profiles, now what would you do? And then lastly, let's get really crazy here. What if you're planning a party and you wanted to make something that works for everybody? How cool would it be to be able to do that? How cool would it be to then give everybody a shopping list for the dish that they're going to bring? Now you're building business. You're solving problems. It was said earlier, it's the experience. Let's use McCormick as an example. What is McCormick? Is McCormick a flavor product company? 
or is it an eating experience company that also sells products to enable it? That was effectively the strategic topic that we were wrestling with. And in the end, we decided we're an eating experience company. You don't buy black pepper. You buy you because, because you love black pepper. You buy black pepper because you want to season something with it. You want to make a dish. You don't go to the grocery store focused on buying products. You're trying to get the components you need to create something out of it. It's the experience. So why don't we connect with you that way? Why don't we connect all the steps in the journey? We did a survey of um, households in the US, and we asked them about this, the grocery shopping experience. And you know what we found? We found that folks said that um, they were really dissatisfied with it. And the reason they were dissatisfied is because you know, 14 billion times a year, 120 plus times per household, they do the same thing week after week. They tend to buy the same things. One of the stats I didn't quote you from the chart earlier is that grocery store carries 35,000 items on, on average. How many do you think the average household buys out of the 35,000? Anybody want to guess? 300, 500, 1,000? What do you think? In a year, in a year. Different ones. 342. 270, like 276. They buy 0.7% of the assortment. Too much choice. Too hard to navigate through it. Friction to doing business. And then lastly, examples of think about the kind of analytics, think about the kind of insights you could derive if you understood how things tasted in a comparable way. Think about simple things like in a grocery store, how you, how you understand why all the things might be in a cart versus the historical way of just looking category by category. Right? Look across, because what are you trying to do? You're trying to build the basket. Think about the kind of mashups that would be possible. Think about the kind of insight for the development of new products. You know, new product success rate in this industry is less than 3%. Tens of thousands of new products introduced every year, success rate forever, less than 3%. What if you could make it 4%? So what if there was a platform that could connect all these players in the network of food? What would it do? it would help them to serve the individual consumer. I'll make a bold statement. There's, there may be no brand in the food or consumer packaged goods space that should be a destination platform. There just isn't enough utility to it. There's not enough frequency for it. The retailers they have business being platforms. But what if the brand was a service platform? What if the brand could convey itself and make a meaningful difference in experiences through channel partners that they work with? Now we're talking. There's a crying need in this industry space to connect the dots between the individual, the folks that make the food, and all the other ancillary entities that help you to make choice around it. This space, by any measure, today is dysfunctional. If you wanted to be bold about it, you might say it's just broken. And the example that I'm trying to get across to you is the notion of a platform to change the way that this industry works and help it serve consumers effectively. It's just that simple. But it's not as a new destination. It's as a service, a service to make everybody else's stuff better. See that really complicated chart down at the bottom right nobody can read? Let's see what's on it. There's a couple billion dollars have gone into um, all these different categories of uh, food tech investment over the last three years. Here's the issue with this. This is all silo-based stuff. Remember I was telling you about that survey? We took across, they said people were really frustrated with the shopping experience what, to connect the dots on it. You know why they're frustrated? Because none of this stuff talks to each other. 
and yet we do it over and over and over and over again. There's very little that we do from a repeat purchase and purchase process standpoint than get food. All this tech, all that investment is out there to make pieces of it work better. You know what's really funny? Those households, we gave them the option telling us, um, um, they say, well, what would you do to make it better? You know how like on surveys you usually don't get much written comments? It's like 1,000 people. We had 800 people out of the 1,000 surveyed. They wrote paragraphs on what they would be willing to provide as information about themselves and their household just to make it work a little better. So now we've got unmet need, billions being lit on fire, people desperately looking for help and the means to provide it. We should be able to attract some developers to this space. What do you think? It's not sexy. But it's pretty freaking important. This is a survey of moms, 15 years running, top three stressors for mom. What's in consistently in the top three stressors for mom, 15 years running? What's that? Husband? Husband? That's probably one. <laughs> you didn't say my house, we said houses in general. Good, good answer. It's the question, what's for dinner? It's the question, what's for dinner? It freaks mom out. Right? OK. Why do we care? So, like, 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 so we, we, we came up with this idea for a platform. Wh wh why did we keep going with it? Because here's what happened. We tested it on McCormick.com. So a flavor print user said so somebody who's profiled and gets tailored recommendations contextualized recommendations and a non-flavor print user who doesn't. And, and the experience of McCormick.com is pretty typical for a food property, right? So the gray is the typical experience. So you know, per visit, 1.39 minutes, return visits, 14%, pages per visit, 1.89, bounce rate, 69%. Most food sites and retail sites in the food space, consumers get there through search, they hit it, they get what they want, they go away, they bounce off. Flavor print. And this was sustained. 1.39 minutes went to 19 minutes. 14% return visits went to 34. Pages per visit went from under 2 to over 11. Bounce rate dropped to 3%. Oh, and I forgot, and they bought more. And when we measured whether it was actually having an impact on purchase, and the consumer bought more. She was happier and she bought more because we were presenting solutions in context, tailored to her. See those logos up there? This data is real. Right? By metric, these are reported stats from each of those entities. The delta between the red and the and the and the, the gray is the kind of opportunity. Can you imagine what Walmart would do if they could get a typical visitor to spend something closer to 19 minutes instead of six? Or craft? If they could reduce their bounce rate from a third, how about let's get just how about if it was under 10%? Or all recipes? If they could get page views, let's be conservative. What if they could double page views? You know, they make their money off the ad inventory that they sell on page views. They could double their business. And guess what? And they're doing it in the spirit of serving you better. The whole premise of this idea of a platform in food is to serve you better. You have needs that aren't met. There's lots of money chasing you. It could be spent differently. And we can end up with a stacked win for all concerned. But we got to glue it together. So the points that were made throughout the day relative to the functioning of the platform, it's a, in the end, this is going to be about connectivity. Um, 
Let me wrap it together this way. If I've confused you, I apologize. Let me try to give you a couple big analogies that you can work with. So what we did for food with Flavorprint is like what Pandora did with the music genome. We did it for the food genome. Here's, there's two big differences. One is, is we don't have an army of uh, food scientists and chefs trying to figure out what everything tastes like and then coding the attributes. We did it algorithmically. So we spent about 10 million bucks figuring that out. We were sitting on a billion dollars worth of research over the last 30 years in why all of us like what we like and make the choices we make, both at home and away from home. Not just the herbs and spices and seasoning, but just food. So we built, we codified, let's call it the food genome, and we put a, a technology stack of some machine learning, some big data, a fair bit of NLP on top of that to understand all this semantic description of things and make sense out of it. The second thing that's different from Pandora is you go to Pandora to listen to music. Our vision, we'll see if we get there, is Flavorprint goes with you and meets you where you go. Imagine if you could take your Pandora profile and you could take it with you to buy or listen to music from Amazon, Walmart, or Apple. Each of those entities knows you differently. Each of those under entities understands you in a different context. Your profile isn't the competitive advantage. Your profile in context is. That's why everybody should be OK with a portable view of you. And quite frankly, making that view more informative. Second piece is, is so, so that second thing around Pandora is it's not a destination. It's a service. It goes with you. It's not a destination. The other piece, flavor print, this business model that we have is also like Apple Pay. You take it with you. It goes with you. It brings utility with the things that you're trying to do. When you make choices around the food you're going to eat, you might consult 10 different points of reference before you actually make the selection. Digital is now in three to five of them. It's increasing, especially with the generational change. So if you want to think about how, why a platform is important to this sleepy little industry space, which is over three trillion worldwide, with all that money being lit on fire, Here's a good example of uh, something to wrap your head around that brings together a lot of the ideas that you heard about today. Any questions? So I actually, Peter Evans, uh, Center for Global Enterprise, I actually downloaded your app. Yep. And so my question is around, and actually used your example in a presentation I gave, Yep. Uh, recently, because I love the idea of creating a platform in industry, people don't typically think about it, um, is the degree of personalization. Um, the assumption is, is that I have one flavor print, but actually I will eat differently for things right. that I do very quickly versus a th three hour meal with friends, right. et cetera, et cetera. And so Pandora, you can create playlists and I right. will pick different playlists. So I didn't see the platform moving in that direction, so I have a question on. Yeah, the it's because we keep it secret, right? So. Yeah. Uh, as we, as, is, as, we build, as we build, what we do today is we understand those differences in your state behind the scenes. We anticipate your state and bring that forward in the recommendations that you see. As we grow, you'll see more of that becoming visible, the equivalent of a playlist, right? Which is, and the simple way is by day part. I'm different at breakfast than at lunch than at dinner, or by occasion. I'm different for a special occasion, a special meal, a holiday, a weekend versus maybe a weeknight. Okay. So one follow-up question. Yep, um, going to Sanji's presentation on currency. Yep. What is the currency transaction with your partners? The currency we, we, transaction, we, we, we is, transaction is we're, we leverage existing trade promotion programs that are being run by the retailers that the manufacturers participate in and we're offering a, a new alternative for a trade program. So so we're not inventing any new payment mechanism. We're just giving them an option to spend against something different. And that's that 52 billion is being lit on fire. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.